it's great to be here. And uh, I think I just pressed the forward, right? I didn't have a, the training. So I, it, it's fat. I'm so glad uh, I actually had the second case cancel because of a, a little cough and it's, it was like the best thing. So uh, I can uh, be part of this live. Uh, it's great to see everybody, at least virtually. So I'm going to talk about the a little bit about the current state of periacetabular osteotomy. It was developed uh, in the 80s, uh, 35 years ago, by Professor Gons and colleagues. And surprisingly, the techniques of the boning cuts has remained very similar over that period of time. But there's been a lot of approach modifications that different people have to uh, uh, limit soft tissue uh, damage and scar and to improve postoperative rehabilitation. It should be thought of as a balancing of the mal-oriented horseshoe-shaped acetabular cartilage over the femoral head, which leads to an optimal use of a limited area of hyaline cartilage for weight bearing. We don't increase the weight hyaline cartilage, but we make it more efficient. Let's go back one. I view it as a continuum of osteotomies in pediatric orthopedics. When I started, it was you had to do something by age five. Uh, as there was an obscure surgery that was only done in a few places in skeletal maturity. But now I think it's uh, a continuum from Salter, Pemberton, Triple, and PAO, depending on the level of maturity. The benefit is fragment mobility. You leave the post, uh, posterior column intact. You can correct acetabular version and subtle abnormalities. It remains extra articular and it maintains the abductors. Currently, we're doing smaller incisions. We do rectus sparing approaches. We use transischemic acid and cell saver to decrease blood loss. We can do it with hip arthroscopy at the same time. The correction can be more personalized depending on the type of deformity that they have. The complications for a big surgery like this are relatively minimal and there's reliable outcomes with a lower vision rate. And over the years, as we learn more about the hip, the indications have expanded. They are symptomatic patients in most cases, where imaging, including oftentimes CT, MRI, and X-ray, and exam, has some deficiency, anterior, posterior, lateral, global, or iatrogenic. And we look a lot more than just the lateral CE angles. In 2003, in this paper, Gans mentioned that the coverage may be deficient in more regions than the classic anterior lateral. And this was highlighted in a recent paper by Jeff Wilkin and Paul Boulay out of Ottawa. And they have a classification of symptomatic acetabular dysplasia that discusses the different sorts of dysplasia. The classic dysplasia anterior lateral is in, shown here with a break in Shenton's line, scale immature patient, good cartilage, upturned sorcele and tonus angle. And this uh, obviously is a good example of the classic indication for a periacetabular osteotomy. But now we're seeing things three-dimensionally with uh, patients coming in with hip pain and deformity, and this is under coverage anteriorly. The anterior aspect, the acetabulum, just never fully developed, leaving to anterior overload. You can have the same posterior laterally, where you have acetabular retroversion or posterior under coverage. This can even have impingement in the front if they're overcovered in the front. Or you can have combined version abnormalities where both the femur and the acetabulum are deficient, for example, anteriorly, and you need to address both sides of the, of the joint. And more and more, we're seeing cases of iatrogenic deficiency after hip arthroscopy, where there's been alterations to the acetabular rim as well as the labrum, and the capsule is never fully healed, leading to symptomatic uh, dysplasia. Mild dysplasia is more recognized over time as we're seeing patients, uh, increased amount of patients with hip pain. Instability is the pathomechanics. Um, there's no subluxation in this group. The lateral center edge angle is 18 to 25, and there can be version abnormalities. If we look at the natural history studies that have been recently done, uh, helping us guide in numbers, what is normal on an AP pelvis and what can lead to arthrosis, a lateral center edge angle of less than 25, a tonus angle of greater than eight, less than 80% femoral head coverage, or shallow acetabular depth has been risk factors for progression of arthritis on observational studies. Currently, the incisions we make are smaller, more of a transverse incision uh, that's better cosmetically appealing. And then uh, you can also see you can do arthroscopy distally. 
Everybody does the PAO with a little different uh, flair depending on their experience and their training. But in the end, we have to assess correction. Depending on the surgeon, some people will use an AP pelvis. Sometimes you use just fluoroscopy. We use fluoroscopy, but now we've added imaging at the end where we use this Radling software that can interoperatively show our pelvic tilt. So it mimics the standing AP x-ray, and that really helps us to make sure we're correcting it in a functional position so our acetabular walls are well balanced. And then we can basically dial in the lateral CE angle we want. The outcomes, um, and Professor Mills is on this, he's got one of the longest term uh, papers uh, in North America, but on that paper, 75% maintain their hips at a mean of 18 years. The burn series that's a few years old now, so 30% uh, survival at 30 years in the initial series. And a recent paper by Wiles uh, out of uh, the group at Mayo showed that the uh, PAO does affect the natural history of hip dysplasia. For example, if a patient has a PAO and is tonus one at the time of surgery, the mean time they stay in tonus one till they go to tonus two is 18 years. And that was better than their natural history. Outcome variables, things that are important. Um, there's many papers with different things, including age, sex, et cetera. But if there's minimal arthrosis, tonus is zero to one. In some tonus two patients, you may do it if they're younger and they have good motion. They have to have good joint congruity, impingement-free motion after surgery, and appropriate acetabular correction, including version. When we looked at our outcomes, just how often the surgery is now used for hip pain as well, as well as deformity, are we improving patient symptoms using PROMS? We found 85% of cases at greater than two years um, felt better uh, with the MCID, reaching MCID with a modified Harris hip score and pass was met 67% of the time. We wanted to look at variables in patients that don't feel better, hoping that we could perhaps learn from them or maybe not do the surgery on them. But what we found is there wasn't any specific one variable that stood out. This was greater than two years and there was no variable that differentiated those that had a substantial clinical benefit from a minimal clinical benefit. And this included when we compared scope PAO versus PAO, age, previous surgery, femoral version, and alpha angle. As far as complications, what we worry about is femoral and sciatic nerve palsies, which have decreased over the years. Implant-related issues uh, such that require removal or exchanges are now what we're seeing sometimes is some metal allergies. Delayed unions, uh, posterior column stress fractures can occur, usually observed and improved. Hip flexor tendonitis is not uncommon, especially at the six to 12 month period, but the majority of these are treatable. Adjuvant procedures are often discussed with a PAO. You can do an osteochondroplasty, uh, hip arthroscopy, proximal femoral osteotomy, and surgical hip dislocation. Arthrotomy is used to evaluate for atrogenic impingement, as we do know that if you have residual impingement, after a PAO, it can actually lead to uh, worse outcomes. So there may be improved outcomes with hip arthroscopy. And this is an example, when we use it, we do 3D CT studies, and if we have a significant cam lesion, especially limited range of motion, we'll open the joint and do an um, osteochondroplasty at the time of a PAO. There are still some uncertainties that we're trying to understand, such as what is the role of hip arthroscopy and labral uh, repair at the time of PAO versus PAO only. There's now a prospective randomized control study in the anchor group that's trying to answer that. When do we need to address femoral version with a PAO? What about ischial femoral impingement? And again, there's always a debate on the mild or borderline cases. When we looked at the mild dysplasia in adolescence, we found these are usually young people with congruent hips. They, do, they did very well after um, PAO although they have a significant preoperative, um, non-operative treatment, which is preferred. Labral tears are very common in intraarticular pathology uh, with hip dysplasia. We wanted to see, we wanted to compare the groups that had a hip arthroscopy and labral repair versus just a PAO only. And in 2016, we published this paper and it showed not much difference between the two groups. We repeated this just recently by our fellow um, last year and uh, just are finishing writing it up. But what we found is the two groups are not statistically significantly different from each other, which means either we're picking the right ones to do the scope PAO or it doesn't matter in most patients. There is 2% of the patients in the scope, non-scope PAO group, just the PAO only, that went back for hip arthroscopy. 
Proximal femoral osteotomy is used to improve congruity. If there's significant torsional malalignment, like patients that really can't compensate for this, perthes or, proximal, or pediatric femoral head deformity. And here's an example of a patient who has both acetabular and femoral antiversion, and she walks with a significantly internally rotated gait, so we address it on both sides of the joint. We have not found that femoral version really impacts outcomes on PAO surgery, but about 5% of the time with significant antiversion, we've had to go back and do a femoral derotation osteotomy, but the majority of times, if they're compensated, uh, we don't have to do anything to the femur. We now do surgical hip dislocation in PAOs with uh, perthy or pediatric type deformities, or if there's an osteochondritis, uh, desiccans or OCD in this patient, uh, we're able to uh, use an allograft, uh, fresh frozen allograft, and do the PAO. Ischial femoral impingement is more and more recognized, but it's where the lesser trochanter impinges on the ischium. We found that it's in about 18% of patients on MRI preoperatively with PAO, and it actually increases postoperatively, but in very few patients as it creates symptoms. So in general, the, I think the PAO is a uh, great surgery to improve symptoms in the vast majority of patients. There's not necessarily a consistent variable for failure to meet MCID, indicating the importance of, of uh, picking the right patients, as well as making sure uh, expectations are discussed with patients preoperatively. And we're doing more work to assess the role of arthroscopy, osteochondroplasty, femoral osteotomy, and acetabular correction. Thank you.